Okay, let's begin. This is the second of a series of presentations on reflections on passages in Savitri. And the title of this talk is The Psychology of Fate. In the previous presentation in the series, which was titled, What is Fate? It explored the philosophy of fate. It focused on the relation of fate to the philosophical duality of being and becoming, and on the idea that fate is the working out of truth, or the truth of being, in the context of time and space and the evolution of consciousness from inconscient matter through ignorance to the all-conscious and all-delightful infinite spirit. This presentation will provide a more psychological view of fate. It will examine the difficult working out of the evolutionary development of the individual's consciousness in the context of the wider universal consciousness of which we are not normally aware. The lower subconscient, the inner subliminal, and the higher superconscient regions of consciousness, which strongly influence our development and the conditions and the obstacles that we face. The passage from Savitri that I will discuss only rarely mentions the word fate, but its relation to fate is implicit throughout. Our spiritual destiny, which it describes, is identical to that expressed in the passage examined in the previous presentation and figured in the final word of both passages, God. The passage comes in Book 7, the Book of Yoga, Canto 2, the parable of the search for the soul. It's a particularly powerful and enlightening canto, <clears throat> which conveys deep spiritual knowledge in a succession of profound passages. At the start of the canto, during a sleepless night in which Savitri struggles inwardly with the looming fate of Satyavan's impending death, she hears a voice from the summits of her being, counseling her to put aside her grief, go deep within and find her soul, unite herself with the divine's force, and conquer death. The rest of the canto is written from the perspective of an omniscient narrator who describes the evolutionary development of consciousness here on Earth, emerging out of matter into subconscious life and then mind, and eventually adventuring into infinite mind space. The narrator describes the dark forces lurking in man's subconscious depths, which can fill with horror and carnage God's fair world, but also assures that there is a guardian power. There are hands that save. Calm eyes divine regard the human scene. Following these lines comes the last section of the canto from which our passage is taken on page 482. Here the narrator steps back to survey man's consciousness and the inner psychological forces that impel and impede his evolutionary journey. The passage runs about three pages, but I'll break it into short segments and reflect on each segment in succession. It begins. All the world's possibilities in man are waiting as the tree waits in its seed. 
His past lives in him. It drives his future's pace. His presence acts, fashion, his coming fate. The unborn gods hide in his house of life. The demons of the unknown overshadow his mind, casting their dreams into live molds of thought, the molds in which his mind builds out its world. His mind creates around him its universe. All that has been renews in him its birth. All that can be is figured in his soul. It's striking in its profundity. He begins by relating man's coming fate to a tree that is waiting in its seed to sprout. But this, this is more than a metaphor. It's a phenomenon of nature that plays out everywhere at every level. All we see in life is a process of realizing its future possibilities. And those future possibilities are potentials that exist in the present. All life, all existence is a process with the past, present, and future. For all is revealed in time. The present is a product of the past, and the present is fashioning and shaping the future. The past lives still within the present, for all that exists now is a growth and further development of the past. And the past is driving the unfolding of the future. Sri Aurobindo suggests that associations with karma when he says that the past drives his future's pace, which suggests that our past determines or at least moderates the speed at which we can develop. If we did not have to carry the implications of our past actions, if we were completely free in the present moment, our development could leap forward without restraint wherever we wanted to go. But nature is a measured development out of the past, an efflorescence rather than a new creation at every moment. And yet Sri Aurobindo gives importance to the present when he says his presence acts, fashion, his coming fate. Our present, present acts have karmic consequences, which we will have to bear in the future. We are not completely off the hook because of our past. We are responsible for our present actions and will reap the consequences. Sri Aurobindo does not present a rigid determinism in which all has been predetermined in the past. He gives some scope, at least, for our present decisions, for the actions that we take now. In the next two sentences, Sri Aurobindo links this unfolding development of fate to the realm of the occult, our inner being, hidden within our house of life, where we find unborn gods, and the demons of the unknown. The unborn gods seem to portend the future, like the tree waiting in the seed, something that is yet to come, perhaps our own future selves. And yet they exist, in some sense, as potentialities at least, but more than that, perhaps, as spiritual presences that are slowly taking form. 
The demons of the unknown are interesting and apparently crucially important because they overshadow our minds and by their dreams create the live molds of thought by which we build out our world. In ancient Greek mythology, demons are beings that are part God, part human. That is demigods, or we could say lower level gods. And these spirits were viewed as dispensers of our fate. Perhaps they are beings of the occult mind regions, for they seem concerned primarily with thought. They create the molds of our thought, the patterns and grooves in which our thoughts move. Along with patterns and grooves, we could add worldviews, paradigms, mental constructions, recurrent ideas, mental obsessions. If we sit quietly in meditation, and observe the thoughts that cross through our minds, we may ask ourselves, from where do these thoughts come? A scientist may say, from random or habitual patterns of firings of neurons in the brain. But that does not really answer the question of how sudden releases of electrical potentials in cells get translated into particular types of thoughts or mental images or motivations in the mind. Here we have an occult explanation for the phenomenon that they originate in a region of mental existence in which live mental beings who influence and inspire us we who are at least in part mental beings embodied on earth in living bodies and brains. This explanation is crucial to the psychology of fate because it suggests that our fate is embedded in this vast occult realm of mind and is influenced, if not driven, by the beings who live there. One-line sentences in Savitri are usually especially important, often driving home a significant point made in the previous sentences. And here we have this line. His mind creates around him its universe. It suggests that we live in a world our minds have created. We like to think that we live in a world that exists objectively, independent of our mind. And yet we know what we perceive of the world is determined, more or less, by our mental assumptions and expectations, by our hopes and fears, by our education, upbringing, and socialization, by the influences of our parents and family and ancestors, by the traditions and customs and values of our community, society, country. All of these are working together to shape our thoughts, viewpoints, goals, emotional tendencies and behaviors. These are outer influences on our mind that shape our perceptions of the world. But Sri Aurobindo has added to these influences the occult influences of the demigods. It's safe to say that no two people see or experience the world in quite the same way. And yet one may say, okay, we each look at the world differently, but the world is still the world, regardless of how we look at it. But is it? The line says that our mind creates our universe. The world is in large measure a product of our mind. 
Our mind is instrumental in shaping our life and environment. Our mental choices are important determinants of where we live, with whom we live and interact, and how we live. They largely determine our physical health, our physical appearance, our physical habits, and day-to-day -day routines of our life. They largely determine the physical organization, condition, and appearance of our environment. We can make our world beautiful, or we can make it a hellscape. There are certainly other more universal factors, both occult and outward, that influence our mental views and choices, as described above, but these factors are shaping our outer life and world, largely through our mind and its perspectives and choices. The last couplet, all that has been renews in him its birth. All that can be is figured in his soul. Is also profound and echoes the first sentence of the passage which asserted that the world's possibilities are waiting in man like a tree within a seed and that man's past lives in him and drives his future's pace. It again connects the present mankind to its past and its future. Of course, we normally lose sight of this connection and live more in the moment and in its immediate vicinity. The past renews in us its birth in several senses, depending on the scope of the time frame we consider. In the short term, look at how we repeat certain thoughts, feelings, and behaviors which have become habitual. At the midterm, we repeat certain tendencies we have had in past lives due to their karmic consequences or simply due to the fact that we have not outgrown them. And at the long term, we still carry in our bones the inconscience of the original material universe in our life energies and emotions, the animal propensities of our evolutionary forebears. In our sense mind, the rudimentary mind of animals and primitive humans. And in our intellectual mind, the world views and ideas of thinkers throughout the ages. But at the same time, we hold within our soul all that can be. Just like the seed holds within it the tree, we hold within our soul the future man, the divine man, or the divine successors to mankind. They also press for release, like the chick in its shell or call us from the future, which somewhere already exists in another higher plane of our being to open ourselves to its influence and manifestation on Earth. So let's continue with the next part of the passage. Issuing in deeds its scores on the roads of the world obscure to the interpreting reason's guess, lines of the secret purpose of the gods. In strange directions runs the intricate plan, held back from human foresight is their end, and the far intention of some ordering will or the order of life's arbitrary chance finds out its settled order, sorry, 
finds out its settled poise and fated hour. Our surface, watched in vain by reason's gaze, invaded by the impromptus of the unseen, helpless, records the accidents of time, the involuntary turns and leaps of life. Only a little of us foresees its steps. Only a little has will and purposed pace. In the first line, issuing in deeds its scores on the roads of the world. The pronoun it seems to refer to man's soul that was mentioned in the previous line, that is in the last line of the previous part of the passage. In that line, Sri Aurobindo says, all that can be is figured in his soul. The present line seems to suggest that the future possibilities issue or emerge out of his soul in deeds, in actions, which are scored or etched on the roads of the world, that is, on the various broad paths of endeavor and activity in the world that lead into the future. The next two lines suggest that although the soul's actions are obscure to the mind's surface reason, they are marking and perhaps further widening these roads of the world, which are working out the secret purpose of the gods. In other words, although we may not understand where we ourselves and the world may be headed, or the deeper purpose behind our actions and the world's, they are working out the secret purpose of the gods. The next sentence further elaborates on this idea. First, Sri Aurobindo says that these lines of the secret purpose of the gods that are being etched by the soul's actions on the roads of the world run in strange directions, forming an intricate, complex, and detailed plan. Again, he reiterates that our human mind cannot see where these convoluted actions and developments are leading, but he says they are following the intention of some ordering divine will. In the last two lines of the sentence, he says, or the order of life's arbitrary chance finds out its settled poise and faded hour, suggesting that the intention of the divine ordinary will or divine ordering will mentioned in the previous line may take the appearance of or be alternatively interpreted as life's arbitrary chance. But nevertheless, these chance happenings of life seem to follow some order and then fall into a settled poise in time's faded hour. We may note that science, which views inconscient matter and energy as the source of all things, does not accept the existence of some cosmic ordering will, but rather accepts this view that the development of the universe and the evolution of life is occurring due to an arbitrary chance that falls into various settled poises at different stages in the course of time. For example, into the poises of atoms or galaxies, planets, trees, elephants, and human beings. 
In the next sentence, Sri Aurobindo further elaborates on the mind's inability to understand ourselves, our world, and to where these are moving in the future. Things are constantly happening, but our minds cannot understand why, from where these new developments are originating. The mind can only see the surfaces of things. It cannot see their occult depths, their deeper realities of which they are but the outer appearance or representation. The impromptus of the unseen continually invade the surface and seem to stimulate the accidents of time and involuntary turns and leaps of life. Impromptus are something that arise spontaneously or without preparation. Sri Aurobindo is not saying that what happens on the surface of life is truly accidental or due to involuntary turns and leaps of life, but that is how it appears to the mind, which cannot penetrate into the occult depths and can only helplessly record what seem to it to be accidents. This relates also to the earlier pair of alternative explanations for things, the far intention of some ordering will, which we could call the spiritual view, or the order of life's arbitrary chance, which we could call the scientific or materialistic view. Here, Sri Aurobindo is suggesting that this scientific view results from reason's inability to see below the surfaces of things into their occult depths. He will elaborate on these depths in the next part of the passage. Like the last segment, this part closes with a couplet that repeats the first words of the lines. Only a little of us foresees its steps. Only a little has will and purposed pace. Here, Sri Aurobindo reiterates, but also slightly moderates, the stark distinction he made between the occult depths, in which the gods work out their secret purpose through the deeds that issue from man's soul, versus the surfaces of life, which reason can only watch in vain and helplessly record what seem to be accidental happenings. Here, he gives the mind a little credit and says, only a little of us foresees its steps, and only a little has will and purposed pace. So to a small extent, by our reason and perhaps by our intuition, we are able to see where we are headed and to choose our purposed pace, our own self-directed steps. In the next segment, Sri Aurobindo begins to enter into these occult depths to show how they influence our lives. A vast subliminal is man's measureless part. The dim subconscient is his cavern base. Abolished vainly in the walks of time, our past lives still in our unconscious selves. And by the weight of its hidden influences, is shaped our future's self-discovery. Thus all is an inevitable chain, and yet a series seems of accidents. The unremembering hours repeat the old acts. Our dead past round our future's ankles cling and drags back the new nature's glorious stride. 
or from its buried corpse, old ghosts arise, old thoughts, old longings, dead passions live again, recur in sleep or move the waking man to words that force the barrier of the lips, to deeds that suddenly start and or leap his head of reason and his guardian will. In the first two sentences, Sri Aurobindo begins by identifying and distinguishing between two aspects of our inner being, the vast subliminal and the dim subconscious. We find in his letters on yoga that Sri Aurobindo generally uses the term subliminal to refer to the inner mind, the inner vital, and the subtle physical realms of our being. The levels of consciousness of these realms are roughly the same as our outer mind, vital and physical consciousness, but they are vaster realms that are freer in their self-expression and can carry a more potent power. They were created in a step-by-step -step descent or involution of consciousness from the spiritual heights into the depths of material form. Thus, they were created before matter and do not have the density and rigidity of matter. As a result, they are lighter and more plastic, more permeable to forces of the spiritual heights, but perhaps also from below to the dim subconscious. They are peopled with beings and scenes and events which embody the energies and tendencies of their corresponding levels. There are many domains at different levels, from the subtle physical to the higher reaches of mental consciousness, each giving form to the different types of energies. The subconscious is a lower level of consciousness that is between the inconscient, which is a complete absence of conscious awareness, and the relatively obscure consciousness of our physical and vital being. Like the subliminal, it is a vast universal realm, but is murky, shadowy, perplexing. It also has a personal aspect unique to our individuality, which contains impressions from our past experiences in life. Thus, impressions of our thoughts, feelings, motivations, and actions remain in the subconscious and can again rise and press their way into our surface consciousness. It is this more personal aspect that is emphasized in the remainder of this part of the passage. These hidden realms of our being tie together our past, present, and future. They contain all the levels of evolving consciousness from its first awakenings in matter to the spiritual heights, which will be in our future self-discovery. Thus, they carry the memories and remnants of Earth's evolutionary past, as well as the archetypes of the future divine beings that will inhabit this Earth. All of this is part of our vaster being of which we are unaware, and all of this is shaping our evolutionary course and pace. In our surface consciousness in which we usually live, we are unaware of them and their influences on our life 
and thus we cannot understand why and how things are happening as they do, either in our personal life or in the world at large. Our evolutionary past retards our evolutionary development into spiritual consciousness and being. And yet our greater spiritual being also calls us and presses on our outer consciousness to manifest its divine possibilities. Thus all is an inevitable chain, and yet a series seems of accidents. Our personal evolutionary progress and trajectory is embedded in the larger evolution of consciousness on Earth. And yet it has its own unique way and pace shaped by our personal actions and development in the line of our soul's evolution through multiple lives on Earth. The course of development we have been taking personally in past lives continues to influence us in this life. And the impressions and consequences of deeds from our past lives may rise from these inner depths into our present. At the same time, the impressions and consequences of our present thoughts and actions persist in the subliminal and subconscious realms and continue to influence us after they have receded into the past. More strongly now in our present life, but also in future lives. Thus that little of us, which has will and purpose pace, which makes choices regarding our thoughts and actions, also has its role and consequence for our future. Even though our will may not be entirely free and independent, it is important and it can be developed and strengthened. Sri Aurobindo continues, and old self lurks in the new self we are Hardly we escape from what we once had been. In the dim gleam of habits, passages, in the subconscious darkling corridors, all things are carried by the porter nerves and nothing checked by subterranean mind, unstudied by the guardians at the doors and passed by a blind instinctive memory, the old gang dismissed, old canceled passports serve. Nothing is wholly dead that once had lived. In dim tunnels of the world's being and in ours, the old rejected nature still survives. The corpses of its slain thoughts raise their heads and visit mind's nocturnal walks in sleep. Its stifled impulses breathe and move and rise. All keeps a phantom immortality. This reiterates and further elaborates what has already been described. Our own past and the world's past continues to live in our subconscious depths and they rise again into our mind and action. They may raise their heads in our dreams in mind's nocturnal walks in sleep and thus press closer to the surface. 
An interesting new idea developed here is that these remnants from the past, in order to rise to the surface mind and life, must pass through darkling corridors, past the guardians of the doors, who presumably could stop them if they were studied. But they are deceptive in passing through, disguising themselves, and appearing as if new ideas, feelings, or motivations. It reminds me of this letter from Sri Aurobindo. To clear the vital, you must get out of it all compromise with falsehood, no matter how specious the reason it advances, and get the habit of simple, straightforward, psychic truth engraved in it, so that nothing may have a chance to enter. If this lesson can be imprinted in that part of the vital which is capable of such compromises, some good will come out of this wrong movement. Put the mother's notice henceforth at the door of your vital being. No falsehood hereafter shall ever enter here. And station a sentry there to see that it is put into execution. There is another long conversation of the mother recollected by Mona Sakar in his book, Sweet Mother, Luminous Notes, related to this issue. And I'd like to read some parts of it. She says, whether it is a thought to be eliminated or an impulse to be conquered, one must approach them with the same ardor and meticulousness in order to cast them away from oneself once and for all, to eliminate them completely with a rigorous strictness. For they are very clever, very cunning, and they find formidable and well-calculated tricks and means clothed in delightful and pleasant appearances with very sweet and subtle ways in order to distract us, to lure us, so as to make us fall into their inextricable traps and make us their slaves. And then she describes the alternative if we let them pass through the doors into our outer consciousness and being. Otherwise, if you take a small step towards them, a slight movement in order to listen to them and try just a bit, I tell you that it is over. Instead of trying a bit, there will be something that will push you until you become miserable and are covered in filth. Once under their influence, you will be drawn into the abyss, whatever you may try. It should be mentioned that these influences, seeking entry into our outer consciousness and life, may come from both the subconscious and the subliminal consciousness. In fact, what the mother describes here pertains particularly to influences from the subliminal. These influences may include suggestions from hostile forces, beings, and energies consciously in opposition to the divine and to spiritual development. In the continuation of the conversation, she says, there is no way to get rid of these tiny beings that surround you avidly to take the least opportunity to jump on your back. That's how it is. All the time, there are forces spying on us, watching us, hovering around us. <coughs> 
in order to find the least opportunity, an imperceptible occasion. If there is a little gap in our armor, immediately they attack us with a vengeance. As soon as one begins doing yoga or purifying oneself, there are always these hostile forces which come to disturb our work. They are amazing and find means to lower the consciousness. One must be very careful and be on one's guard against these malicious suggestions. Thus, not only is there our personal karma from the past that impedes our progress, but there are also universal forces from lower levels of consciousness and clever and malicious hostile forces that invade our personal consciousness and cloud, distort, and pervert our thoughts, emotions, motivations, and naturally, these latter forces utilize our personal weaknesses to gain access. This is why spiritual progress and transformation of the nature is so difficult. But it is also why it is so important to become vigilant and determined in will to stop these invaders before they gain entrance into our thoughts, feelings, and actions. The passage in Savitri continues. Irresistible are nature's sequences. The seeds of sins renounced sprout from hid soil. The evil cast from our hearts once more we face our dead souls come to slay our living soul. A portion of us lives in present time, a secret mass in dim inconscience gropes. Out of the inconscient and subliminal arisen, we live in mind's uncertain light and strive to know and master a dubious world whose purpose and meaning are hidden from our sight. Above us dwells a superconscient God, hidden in the mystery of his own light. Around us is a vast of ignorance, lit by the uncertain ray of human mind. Below us sleeps the inconscient, dark and mute. Sri Aurobindo succinctly positions the human being and his development in the larger context of his larger being. We have arisen out of the dim subconscious and vast subliminal consciousness into the outer mind's uncertain light. But still, those inner realms hold sway over our mind and life. We look out at the world around us, a vast world of inconscient matter and ignorant, vital, and mental beings with the uncertain ray of reason to try and make sense of it and find our way forward. Above our mind is an omniscient spiritual consciousness, but it is hidden from our sight. Below our ill-lit scene is a vast silent darkness. It's a humbling picture. 
We should be careful not to be too self-satisfied with our meager achievements. And yet there is hope, and that hope lies in that superconscient God who dwells above us and watches over his manifestation, who fully understands it and is leading it through this ignorance towards its future divine destiny. After this summary, Sri Aurobindo begins a new paragraph and interjects two short transitional sentences before developing that greater hope of which he has merely hinted. But this is only matter's first self-view, a scale and series in the ignorance. This is not all we are or all our world. Our greater self of knowledge waits for us. A supreme light in the truth conscious vast. It sees from summits beyond thinking mind. It moves in a splendid air, transcending life. It shall descend and make earth's life divine. Truth made the world, not a blind nature force. For here are not our large, diviner heights. Our summits in the superconscience blaze are glorious with the very face of God. There is our aspect of eternity. There is the figure of the God we are, his young, unaging look on deathless things, his joy in our escape from death and time, his immortality and light and bliss. Our larger being sits behind cryptic walls. There are greatnesses hidden in our unseen parts that wait their hour to step into life's front. We feel an aid from deep indwelling gods. One speaks within. Light comes to us from above. One thing that is particularly striking in this part of the passage is that Sri Aurobindo describes this as not only God above or as a divine consciousness, but he repeatedly identifies it as our greater self, our own larger being. He calls it our greater self of knowledge, our large diviner heights, our summits, our aspect of eternity, the figure of the God we are, our unseen parts. This ties in with the idea that there is a single continuous thread that already exists connecting our past, present, and future. Our limited mental viewpoint sees only the present and only a very small portion of that, as if through a broken glass which breaks it apart and distorts our vision. Whereas our dead past round our future's ankles clings, our future self is waiting in summits beyond thinking mind to step into life's front and is giving us aid. One speaks within. Light comes to us from above. This help 
from the spiritual heights of our being is omniscient and omnipotent and is accessible to all. We merely have to turn to it and sincerely ask for it. But the spiritual aid that comes from above is not only on an individual basis for those who ask. He says, it shall descend and make earth's life divine. This is the prophetic promise of the descent of the supramental consciousness, creating a new divine life here on earth. This descent occurred nearly a decade after Sri Aurobindo wrote these lines and had already left his body. A detailed account of this descent and its aftermath are described in the mother's talks. But now let's continue with the passage. Our soul from its mysterious chamber acts, its influence pressing on our heart and mind pushes them to exceed their mortal selves. It seeks for good and beauty and for God. We see beyond self's walls our limitless self. We gaze through our world's glass at half-seen vast. We hunt for the truth behind apparent things. Our inner mind dwells in a larger light. Its brightness looks at us through hidden doors. Our members luminous grow and wisdom's face appears in the doorway of the mystic ward. When she enters into our house of outward sense, then we look up and see above her son. A mighty life self with its inner powers supports the dwarfish modicum we call life. It can graft upon our crawl two puissant wings. Our body's subtle self is throned within. In its viewless palace of veridical dreams that are the bright shadows of the thoughts of God. After describing our summits, here Sri Aurobindo illuminates our inner subliminal being, which includes our soul, our inner mind, inner vital, inner subtle physical self. Like the lower subconscious and the higher superconscious parts of our greater being, these hidden realms of our inner being also influence the unfolding of our fate. Our soul from its mysterious chamber acts and its influence presses on our mind and heart and life to exceed themselves. It seeks for good and beauty and for God. This is the most characteristic influence of our soul on the outer life, which Sri Aurobindo describes repeatedly in his prose works and letters usually using the terms truth, good, and beauty. Here he also adds the line, we hunt for truth behind apparent things. And while our mental, emotional, vital, and physical consciousness are normally turned outward to the surfaces of life, they are supported and receive influences from their inner subliminal depths. He describes our inner mind as dwelling in a larger light and looking at us through hidden doors. His exquisite lines reveal 
its influence when it appears in the doorway and enters into our house of outward sense. Similarly, the inner vital, the out, our mighty life self with its inner powers can graft upon our crawl two puissant wings. And even our body has a subtle self within, which is a palace of veridical dreams that are bright shadows of the thoughts of God. Into this subtle physical realm we can enter in our night's sleep, in dream visions, which are veridical, that is, truths or realities, not merely fantasies. These subtle physical realities also influence and shape the structures and realities of our outer physical existence. Thus we see how Sri Aurobindo describes our fate and future destiny in terms of our larger subconscious, subliminal, and superconscient being. Like the tree that develops out of the seed, our soul's divine destiny is gradually developing out of our past and present, which are linked in an inevitable chain. Our individual fate and destiny are part of a wider universal existence and process of evolution that is occurring on earth. And while our fate and future destiny are largely determined by these aspects of our greater being, our surface mind and will also have a role and have their consequences on our future. But it is primarily by opening our outer mind and life to our inner and higher consciousness that we can expand our awareness of the influences driving our fate and gain greater conscious control over the course of our destiny. Now we feel that our dead past around our future's ankles clings, but also we feel an aid from deep indwelling gods. And our soul from its mysterious chamber acts, its influence pressing on our heart and mind pushes them to exceed their mortal selves. Our surface mind and reason, helpless, records the accidents of time, and we feel invaded by the impromptus of the unseen. And yet, truth made the world, not a blind nature force. In our subliminal depths, our inner mind, dwells in a larger light and a mighty life self with its inner powers supports the dwarfish modicum we call life. And it can graft upon our crawl two puissant wings. Our summits in the superconscious, superconscious blaze are glorious with the very face of God. Thank you.